All right, well, thank you all for coming today. I'll introduce myself. My name is Susan Galbraith, and I'm a Senior Manager of Development at Smartsheet, which is just down the road here in Bellevue. Uh, I lead a team working on features on the main desktop application. I've been a developer for about 20 years and spent a lot of that time at large corporations like Expedia and Microsoft. I've been at Smartsheet for about two years now and have been enjoying working in a smaller company. But with the recent company expansion and the IPO, I don't know how much longer I'll be able to stay smaller. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about a project that I worked on recently, the challenges we face implementing it, and the lessons we learned along the way. Uh, quick show of the room, who's used Smartsheet before? Okay, got a few, all right. Um, well, let me give you some context. T tell you a little bit about the application. Um, so Smartsheet is a SaaS application that's used for collaborative work management. What does that mean? Uh, well, a few examples, use cases that our customers have are planning events, coordinating new restaurant location rollouts, and managing agile development processes. The main way to coordinate among teams in Smartsheet all starts with sharing. A user creates a sheet, dashboard, or workspace, and then shares it to the relevant stakeholders on their team. A sharing notification is then sent to the user in email. So here's an example sharing email. This is, again, how many users first learn about Smartsheet. Something was shared with them. So let's take a look at this example sheet. If you've used many of the spreadsheet applications out there, this UI probably looks pretty familiar to you. This is an example task sheet similar to what we use internally for tracking development tasks. I've got a story and a bug in there, both assigned to me. That's a real bug from this project, by the way, something that I had just forgotten to implement. My bad. <laughs> so as a developer, I'd like to know when things are assigned to me so that I can stay on top of my work. To do that, I can add a rule by clicking on the alerts and actions menu up there on the upper left. Here I've created a rule that will notify whoever the task is assigned to whenever one is added or updated. Rules can be created to key off of any column in the sheet for any number of different scenarios. Maybe you want to know when tasks are completed or bugs are filed, you know, lots of different things that you can think on based on different uh, roles on your team. So the notification rules can be created to address a wide variety of needs. You can add as many rules as you like to manage your work. The trigger can be when the data in a row or column changes or anything in the sheet changes. This really helps to let teams collaborate and be aware of what's going on in their project. All the necessary information that you need to do your job is all pushed to you automatically. So here's an example email that's sent with that no when that notification is fired. And let me pause here for a second and note, so far I've been describing how the application works, and now I want to tie it back to the process and how this particular project that I'm, working, that I'm going to describe improves the value of sharing, which is central to Smartsheet, and improves the project workflow. <laughs> Okay, so here are two things that were assigned to me and those relevant grid rows are sent in the email. Prior to this project, email was the only way to receive these notifications. It worked, but it doesn't give many options. And really, it's not the greatest user experience. Email clients don't really give you any flexibility on the display. So in this example here, you can see the relevant changes are shown in yellow. Where are they? They're not even on screen. You'd have to scroll off to the right to see them. So that's not really great. So that brings us to the Notification Center project. There are a number of things that we wanted to address. As I mentioned, the only way to receive notifications in Smartsheet was email. But there's are easily missed because you're in a different UI, so you'd have to be switching back and forth between applications. There's no single place to see everything requiring your attention, nor was there a way to customize how you were notified. Um, email is also pretty noisy, and it starts to feel like spam if you get a lot of it. Does anybody like getting a ton of email? I don't think so. Um, so we added an in-app notification center also for Smartsheet where users can, ever see, can see everything requiring their attention right there in the app. We built mobile push notifications so that users can be notified right away when something requires their attention. Um, this is especially useful for field workers who probably don't want to be refreshing email all day long. These features also brought Smartsheet to parity with most other productivity apps out there and helps make Smartsheet the one place users go to manage their work. This project also laid the foundation for an extensible uh, notification platform that we could use to enable more notification endpoints in the future for messaging apps like Slack, Skype, Facebook for Workplace, desktop browser push notifications, and SMS. We added configuration settings for notification so that users can choose how they want to use the platform. Again, all about flexibility. So to summarize, the main objectives, objectives for this project were to increase the efficiency of the workflow, decrease the email noise, 
and give uh, more notification channels. Here's a high-level architecture of the system. Events happen in the core Smartsheet application, like sharing, update or approval requests, or sheet changes. The app will call a new notification platform, which will in turn send out the notification via different channels, all depending on the user's configuration. They can enable email or other channels, but they will always be displayed in app. We knew that down the road, we wanted to be able to support these other messaging platforms, like Slack and Facebook for Workplace. Those two have already shipped, by the way. So we needed to design the system to be flexible and extensible in the future. So that brings us to service design. The first thing I thought when I heard this project idea is that we can just take whatever data that we already had to generate the emails and display it to the user. So that should be pretty straightforward, right? Well, of course, it's never that easy. We weren't currently storing that data anywhere. So that was our first challenge. What data would we store and how would it be stored? This alone generated a lot of discussions. Uh, I personally was pretty surprised to find that there was a lack of consensus among our stakeholders on even what database we should use. Um, existing services that we had at the time mostly used MySQL or MongoDB, and we discussed arguments for and against both. MySQL is more of a traditional relational database, while Mongo is a documented-oriented database, so they work a little bit differently and each have their pros and cons. We ultimately settled on MySQL due to the ease of use with our service framework. There just wasn't enough significant benefit to choosing any other technology considered that, considering that we'd need to integrate it with our framework. The next question was how to store the notification data. Sheet changes especially can have a lot of data, like a lot, a lot. Um, they will show any row that's changed in the grid up to 100, plus any related data like attachments, comments, who made the change, and so on. Again, not a clear consensus here. So we needed to weigh a few different options. The data that we wanted to display needed to be the state of the grid at the time of changes, not the current state. Um, so where could that data come from? One suggestion was to reconstruct the grid state from the activity log data that we already had based on a timestamp. This would reuse the existing data, which is great, always love that, but performance would definitely be an issue, so we pretty quickly ruled that out. The two options left were to store the grid data in JSON, which is a lightweight data interchange format, or HTML, which includes all that formatting needed to display the data on a web page. The upside of HTML would be good performance on the UI. You could just query by the ID and boom, display it to the user. Um, but it would bloat the data significantly in the database. We ran some calculations on the max grid data size for a notification and realized it could easily be above any option that we had for storing it in MySQL if we chose to go with HTML. So storing JSON uh, compressed in a single field, not normalized in a table, was uh, a nice middle ground. This also leaves some flexibility in case we wanted to update the grid rendering if we needed to. For example, maybe we'd want to change that yellow highlighting to green or something, who knows? Um, you know, different requirements may come up later. Um, JSON also allows for different display requirements between email, in-app, and mobile. Mobile especially has some different requirements for display when you're trying to show so much data on a little screen. So the next step of the project was setting up a new service and getting talking to other pieces of the system. We have a custom service framework at Smartsheet, and the team of Notification Center were all pretty new developers for the company at that point, so that was kind of our, our first time around setting up a new service. Getting all the builds working, deploying to a test environment, all that good jazz took us alone about a week. To give you some history, the custom service framework that we have was developed over a few months in 2014 with our first service deploying in 2015. We had initially evaluated Apache Thrift, which is a service, a framework for service development, but it didn't support some of our requirements like Kerberos for security, and extending it would have been way more complicated, so that's why we ended up writing our own custom framework. In the same time frame, we migrated our database to a sharded environment, so there are lots of moving and growing pieces in our system. Today, we have about a dozen services running in production, and we're continuing to evolve that framework. Push notifications were also new for us in this project, and we evaluated several different frameworks for this. There are the major players like Amazon SNS, Google GCM and Firebase, and other popular options like Urban Airship and OneSignal. Those last two also give you the, the ability to manage messaging campaigns to, over um, push notifications. But we didn't really need that functionality, and there's no reason we would want to pay for it, so we ruled that out pretty quickly. So in the end, we decided again <laughs> to build our own framework that targets each platform directly. There's Google GCM for Android, Apple APNS for iOS, and Amazon SNS for Kindle. 
We ended up dropping support for Kindle before we went live, as that platform just isn't really used by our customers very heavily. So there didn't make sense to incur that cost of supporting it. Uh, the reason that we went with our f custom framework for this is that we didn't want to have, a, to have to give our secret key to a third party who then uses it to pass it on to do the mobile push. And this way, we can also more easily support mobile platform enhancements uh, that, that, you know, as soon as they're available, rather than waiting for a third party to support them. And in fact, we're doing some of that work right now for iOS 12. Uh, one area that we had to be particularly careful of on this project is that we were taking an existing process already in production, which is sending the emails, and adding this new functionality on top of it. We couldn't risk disrupting the current flow of emails out of the system. So we knew we needed a way to move over to this new service in small steps, verifying correctness and performance as we went, and then increasing the traffic. That way, if we saw issues, we could fail back to the old system, troubleshoot, and then try again later. Um, the notification service needed to be able to do two distinct things. Support the endpoints that are called when sending a notification or retrieving notification data, and also batch processing to send the notification out via whatever channel is configured by the user. That could be, again, mobile, email, mobile push, or whatever. Uh, to support this, the service has a common code base that's configured at runtime to either behave as a service or as the batch processor. This separates concerns and protects the service endpoints from being impacted by the performance of batch processing. The work done by the batch processor is done with MQ messages, which also provides some reliability and scalability to the system. Here's the service architecture that we ended up building. The, in the existing system, application notifications, like sharing an update request, would call the email service directly. She changed notifications, like I was describing before, <laughs> would call the workflow rule service to evaluate those changes, to determine if any rules applied, and then if so, call the email service. So in the new system, we were essentially inserting this new notification service in the middle of any call that previously called the email service, storing the data in the database, sending a mobile push or message to other platforms, and calling the email service, all depending on the user's configuration settings. In production release planning, we had to consider that there was, this again, this existing system for email in place that we didn't want to disrupt, <clears throat> excuse me, and be able to fall back to that in case anything went wrong. To facilitate this, we introduced two modes for the system, for the service. Silent mirror mode and conditional mode. Silent mirror mode would send the notifications through the existing email service, as well as the new notification service with its outgoing channels all turned off. This allowed us to verify that the notifications were flowing into the new service, into the database correctly, and the performance of batch processing. We added telemetry on both the notification service and the workflow rules service, and then you can we could verify that those numbers were matching up, seeing that things were really working correctly. Um, conditional mode was used to enable notification center for our EAP customers first, which is our early adopter program, before we rolled it out to everyone. This way we got some early feedback from our customers and made sure that we were on the right track and could make a, some tweaks before we fully went live. We also had a configuration switch for each notification type that we planned to roll out. We started with enabling sheet change notifications and later added sharing, update and approval requests, and reminders. There are many other types of notifications that we may add in the future as well. The remainder continue to be delivered in email. Starting with one type allowed us to get to market sooner and ramp up slowly. So here's what that mobile push notification looks like. And my adorable daughter, who I brag about every chance I get, <laughs> gives you just a quick summary, which should be enough to know if it's something you need to take action on. From here, you can open it in the mobile app and see the full notification data. The mobile app show the same data that's in the desktop application. So again, giving users flexibility and choice in what suits their needs best. Here's the same notification that we looked at earlier in the notification center. We did a few rounds of user research from this feature and quickly rolled out modal form, which is our common design pattern. The design we chose is a panel which pops out from the right side with a list of notifications in descending order by date time. You can click on an item in the list to view the detail of the notification, which also slides out into the screen. Notifications live for 30 days, at which point they are automatically deleted by a database job. The panel was a new type of UI element for us as well, and we went through several iterations of that slide out behavior using CSS transitions to fine tune the user experience and get it correctly, working correctly in all browsers. For you developers out there, you can make your own IE joke. <laughs> To expand a bit on UI in the app, Smartsheet has been around since 2006, and that's before even libraries like jQuery were widely available. 
At the time of this project, the app was written in pure JavaScript. A custom UI framework where had a standard way to create common UI elements like forms. In the last year, we've taken significant steps to modernize our UI. We're in the process of migrating to TypeScript and also creating some new components in React. We've done a lot of work on the look and feel of the app to keep things feeling fresh and to address some usability concerns. So again, okay, back to the notification center. From the details pane, you can expand the grid to see more of the data as well. We played around with several versions of this. So here again, you can see with that, that yellow highlighting that I mentioned before, much easier to read. So initially there was a scaled down version of this grid right in the panel, but it turns out that grids tend to have a lot of columns. Who would have guessed? So once it scaled to fit, you just couldn't really read anything. It was all just tiny squares. So leaving it full size and scrolling was definitely the most usable. And here's what the notification settings pane. As I mentioned before, notifications are always shown in app and users can select which other channels they want to enable. From this pane, you can configure other messaging apps and set whether you want the changes that you make on the sheets to send you notifications as well. Turning that off can reduce the noisiness of notifications as I would assume most people want to be, don't want to be notified of the changes that they themselves just made. But sometimes you do. <laughs> Once we went live and nothing fell over, yay, uh, we got some feedback and made a few more adjustments. There wasn't as much user engagement with this feature as we would have liked initially, and we realized it wasn't as discoverable as we would have hoped. We added a badge to the browser tab to indicate that there are unread notifications, and also added that number in the tab title. This is a common pattern that users are familiar with and makes it stick out that much more. So the automation system itself was still a pretty new feature when Notification Center first went live. So users weren't setting up enough notification rules in the first place, and we needed to do some work on that front as well. The automation team worked on making notification rules easier to discover and started automatically setting up notification rules for when you assign a task to a person. The lesson learned is that the notification delivery system is only effective if the right people are getting the right notifications. So it's important to work on that aspect of the system too. Where appropriate, automatically set up targeted notifications rather than relying on users to discover the feature and set it up themselves. The other thing was that initially, all the notifications were lumped together in one list. Users wanted a way to see just those that they needed to take some action on, and so we created a, a separate filter for update and approval requests. We also made some additional UI updates to show the most useful information in the least amount of space. Our initial implementation was, to be honest, pretty cluttered. So I moved the most actionable information to the top, like the subject and user comments, and moved the sender information to the bottom. User avatars were used, were added to visually convey the sender so that you can more quickly glance at a notification and see if it's something that you need to take action on. After a couple of months, we heard from our ops team that our database was also increasing in size much more quickly than we had anticipated, which actually seems like good news in the beginning, <laughs> but we hadn't really planned for that. So we knew that there would be some ramp up time while users discovered the feature and the general use of alerts and actions was also increasing, but we needed a plan to deal with this increase. We designed the system so that notifications live for 30 days and then are automatically deleted. So that at least gives us an upper limit. And we had considered, well, maybe we can just shorten that time, but uh, in the end, we decided to utilize S3 to allow for more capacity. So the way this process works is that notifications are initially stored in the MySQL database and also copied out to S3. After a week, uh, the job will delete them from the database, after which time the app can then just fetch them from S3. We made use of the S3 auto delete functionality to remove them after 30 days. This process also mitigate, mitigates the latency concerns that we had with S3, as the most recent and heavily viewed notifications are served from the MySQL database, not S3. In closing, there were a few key things in this project that I think really saved us. We spent a lot of time upfront investigating technology decisions, designing and discussing with others on the team and getting buy-in for our decisions. I think if, the, if we had forged ahead with the first suggestions, we would have struggled a lot more. A lesson learned for us was to plan for more data than you ever think possible. Expect the worst, possibility, expect the worst possible scenarios and the ability to recover from them. Lastly, being able to release in phases, verifying metrics on each increment helped us to roll out to production confidently. So here's the rest of the Notification Center team, which I'm super proud of. I included myself as a senior SDE at the time. The team happened to be pretty diverse, actually, and majority women. 
That's a first for me in my 20 year career. I have to say it was pretty awesome. One could attribute part of the success of our team to our collaboration and diverse set of experiences, which helped us to identify risks early, deliver a platform that our customers rated highly, and uh, one that will serve our product strategically into the future as the other teams continue to build on this platform. So to wrap up, I have a few fun facts about the notification service today in production. We process about 250,000 notifications daily in production. The average number of emails for all notification types sent per day is about 580,000. The most recipients in a single notification is 1,324. And the most number of changes in a single notification is 1.135 million. I kind of love to know what users are doing there. Um, and the average number of push notifications per day is 37,000 on iOS, 65,000 on Android, and 4,000 on Slack. I think it's really interesting, actually, that there's so like almost double in Android versus iOS. I don't know if that says something about the state of mobile or something about our specific set of users, but still pretty interesting. Um, and with that, thank you all for listening, and let's open it up for questions. So we usually back up the notification from database to S3. By the end of the day, will it be like tons or thousands of small documents or small objects on S3? Mm -hmm. It's like you use some um, barcodes or whatever to bundle them or zip them together to back up there. Will that be a habit for you guys? Um, I don't think that we've noticed any problem on that front. I mean, they are auto-deleted after 30 days, so that sort of does limit how much that we have out there, but we don't really compress them or combine them to go up to S3 in any way. So only dump them there for backup purposes and not like uh, analysis or query them again later? Well, they will be used. Um, so for the first week, um, if users are looking at their notifications, they'll be from the database, right? So what happens is the, the application will look to see if that notification exists in the database. If it's there, then it will just display it from there. And if not, then it goes out to S3 to grab it from there. Um, and so we actually only use S3 in the case that they're looking at older notifications, which I think probably most people don't even do, actually, because they're listed in descending order by date time. So uh, they're probably looking at the most recent things the most, I would assume. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you so much.